hello everyone um i'm glad that i'm joining i'm glad that you are joining us from wherever you are within and outside canada um, on behalf of the black graduate students association at the university of alberta um, i'm delighted to welcome you to racism's touch i can't quite put my finger on it with dr shirley ann tate the second lecture in the big thinking series at this year's congress of the humanities and social sciences my name is Prof. Colin Zifonu. I am the current president of the Black Graduate Students Association. Um, my colleague Zara Hassan is a doctoral candidate in Educational Policy Studies and the treasurer for our association, and she will moderate the Q&A session. Um, today's event will take place in English, and we are offering ASL and LSQ interpretation, French and English simultaneous interpretation, as well as live closed captioning in English and French. ASL and LSQ interpreters will have now appeared on your main Zoom screen. Um, to turn on simultaneous interpretation, please go um, to the bottom of your Zoom screen where it says interpretation, and you can toggle between the language of presentation and the language of interpretation. Um, to, turn on your, to turn on English closed captioning, please navigate to the bottom of your screen and click on the closed captioning button. Um, you may also find it under settings. For French closed captioning, please click on the link provided in the Zoom chat box. Now, this information will also appear in the Zoom chat box during the event. And to begin, I wish to acknowledge that the University of Alberta, which is hosting us virtually today, is located on Treaty 6 territory, and it's a gathering place for many Indigenous peoples, including the Papaches, Cree, Blackfoot, Miti, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, and Inuit, as well as many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to exist, evolve, and revive ways of being, knowing, sharing of, sharing of knowledge, and creation. Now, introducing our keynote speaker for today. Dr. Shirley Ann Tate is a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Feminism and Intersectionality and Professor in the Sociology Department of the University of Alberta. Um, Dr. Tate also holds positions as Honorary Professor in the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education. Um, higher Education Research at Nelson Mandela University and Visiting Professor at the Center for Ethnic Relations and, National and Ethnic Relations and Nationalism at the University of Helsinki. Um, Dr. Tate researches and writes within the fields of Black Diaspora Studies and publications have been in the areas of intersectional institutional racism, affect hybridity, creolization, beauty and Black anti-racist aesthetics, race performativity, Black and white mixed race lives, and the race and gendered body in enslavement and freedom. Now, following this conversation, Dr. Tate will be able to answer a few questions from the audience. You can submit questions by typing them into the question and answer box. You can also participate in the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag Big Thinking and Congress. So that's Congress, the double S and the H at the end. So again, thank you to you all for being here. Special thanks to you, Dr. Tate, for agreeing to, this, to give this talk. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks very much Prof, for such a wonderful introduction. I also want to thank the BJSA for inviting me to give this talk and also thank Congress for the invitation to speak. It really is an honor to be here. I'll begin. For more than a decade, I've been thinking through the institutional culture of anti-Black racism by analyzing its affects. For example, shame, fear, hate, disgust, contempt. Part of this is about anti-Black institutional racism disappearing into thin air, leaving us thinking, I just can't quite put my finger on it. I will begin with thinking about touch and negative affect through sensing racial distancing. I will then move to racism's institutional disappearance because post-race sensibilities ensure that one, race and racism no longer matter, two, black originated thought like critical race theory and intersectionality are not theory, and three, teaching on race and racism is erased by universities' co-optation of decolonizing the curriculum. I think through disgust and contempt because such negative affects are the basis of shaming encounters in which us, the racialized other, and black originated theory are located as touched, not quite right in the head. I conclude with thinking of post-race academia, where black originated thought, thought and theory is stripped of its decolonizing potential because it is seen as ideological. 
as we currently see in the cultural wars on intersectionality and critical race studies in the US and the UK. So next, touch and affect. I'll give you some examples. Institutional life is white avoidance of my black skin, my gaze. In a university cafeteria, I put the money for my purchase in the cashier's hand and she puts my change on the counter. I touch my student on the shoulder to attract her attention. She turns and flinches before she can control her reaction. I stand in the crowded elevator, but an invisible cordon forms around me so that my skin is not touched and there is no eye contact. I do not shake hands on introduction unless a hand appears in greeting. White avoidance of black touch leads us to think with Jack, Jacques Derrida that touch is a pathway into the self. Touch can invade us without our knowledge or consent. One can touch from an unheard and unseen position of privilege because touch always concerns the other. Thus the touch of anti-blackness is affect laden, marking our belonging or unbelonging. The touch of the white supremacist eye on black skin eradicates individuality. Our flesh becomes black flesh. Our thoughts, black thoughts. Our presence, a form of absence, white absence, quoting Louis um, Ricardo Gordon. White refusal of touching and being touched by blackness resists feeling with and for the racialized other, us, reflecting the contempt and disgust of anti-blackness. In institutional anti-blackness, disgust finds its object, that is us, intolerable and demands its exclusion. However, disgust, repression and anti-black contempt maintain the equity, diversity and inclusion consensus. As the midpoint between tolerance and disgust, contempt inferiorizes, dismisses and ignores. Contempt means we simply do not merit strong affect. We are noticed only sufficiently so as to know that we are not noticeworthy. One can condescend to treat us decently. One may, in rare circumstances, even pity us, but we are mostly invisible and utterly and safely disattendable. Touch conveys disgust, contempt, intolerance, condescension, when it is what Derrida describes as touching without being touched. This touch underlies anti-Black institutional racism. In the racial affective economy set up through tolerance, disgust and contempt, the continuing coloniality of power ensures that white racist touch can be denied as the musings of someone in black who is touched in the head. Touched in the head provides escape from accusations of racism through blame, marking the racialized other, us, as institutional stranger and producing disgust and contempt. Blame negates white individual or institutional guilt. For us, as institutional strangers, fear of blame produces inaction because of the possibility of ostracism, of being more alone than the number one. Aloneness emerges from lack of friendship, collegiality, a touch that admits that I become myself through the other. Lack of the touch of identification points to anti-black post-race sensibilities in the academy that make race and racism disappear. The psychic life of racism in institutions glues a particular social order of post-race sensibilities where anti-black institutional racism disappears to evade the problem of institutional white supremacy. Black knowledge stripped of critical race critique is mainstreamed amidst colorblind racism as disgust and contempt circulate racial feeling through the transmission of affects. The physicality of touch is replaced with sensing the dispersed intensity of racist affect. The intensity of these affects remain as traces that we sense as institutional racism becomes invisible because of its familiarity, frequency, and taken for grantedness. Racism's visible invisibility produces its own institutional psychic life through the power of its deniability. Racist action 
racist in action, maintains white supremacy, privilege, and entitlement. I'll give you an example here. You are out of the country at a conference. Your head of department tells you by email that you must share your room with an unknown person, even though there's no shortage of space. You are never introduced to this person, but discover a stranger one morning in your room who looks at you with animosity with the unspoken question, who are you? Do you have a right to be here? Before saying of his presence being challenged by you that he will be sharing with you. After sleeping on it, you then contact your head of department by email to say that you cannot share with this unknown man because your encounter felt very uncomfortable. The immediate response is, are you saying he's racist? I've had dinner with him and I do not think he is. The room sharing will proceed. If you think that you have experienced racism, use the university procedures to complain. Let us pause here for a moment and think some more about racism's deniability. Her black feminist colleague did not use the word racism, but the white feminist head of department decided that was the topic of the complaint. She blamed her black colleague for a false accusation since she had judged him as a non-racist over dinner. And in doing this denied the possibility of sensing racism and also asked her to use the university's procedures if she thought she had experienced discrimination. Her action, her inaction, left the arrangements in place, even though her colleague had expressed discomfort. The question, are you saying he's racist, and the request to use university procedures attempt, attempt to silence the complaint because complaints threaten the post-race consensus. Racism is deniable, but emerges, producing individual and institutional melancholia within everyday institutional life. For institutions, melancholia is tinged with disgust and contempt, alongside guilt and shame, because it is an impossible space for the post-race sensibilities which it craves, because race and racism resist erasure. For individuals, racism cannot melt into thin air. We feel shame because we are affected by what we come into contact with, as Sarah Ahmed would say. As participants, we are affected by shame, but as watchers, the impact of shame is affecting. If white shame at racism is felt, the urge is to expel the racist other from the self in order not to feel guilt and to maintain an identity devoid of the stigma of racism. However, as we know from Julia Kristeva, the abject refuses expulsion and continues to exert its psychic force. This is the crux of melancholic post-race sensibilities. Institutions and white individuals can admit to racism, but racism cannot disappear into thin air because it is that very air itself. Racism permeates the walls of institutions and animates interactions with such intensity that we can sense it effectively, but cannot voice these feelings because of their deniability. The shared proximity of feminist politics and theory does not enable the black colleague to be touched. Anti-black woman racial feeling is forced into invisibility as it is too unsettling for whiteness. Visibility and invisibility and its relations and their relations of distance and proximity to the black body illustrate that for anti-black racists, we are a very familiar nothing, to quote Lewis Gordon again. Anti-blackness means we are visible, heard, smelled, touched, understood and sensed only as white supremacist constructions. Critical race theory inserts the very black body and psyche that had been an absent presence into thinking race, ethnicity, racism, black life and black death. However, institutions undermine critical race theory's decolonizing impetus through incorporation as curriculum sound bites. Further, teaching courses on race and racism is about isolation. Colleagues not seeing this work as theoretical and questioning its value. Racism's touch reminds those racialized as white of their designated place as beneficiaries of what Charles Mills calls the racial contract. Racism's touch in universities drags white contempt, 
disgust and anti-Black violence in its wake. Black bodies and Black originated theory are not touching, even as their touch challenges the power of institutional anti-Blackness. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Tate, for that amazing um, talk. Um, before we begin, I just want to remind everybody that you are able to send your questions using the Q&A feature. So please, if you have any questions, um, add them to the Q&A um, section and that will be, um, I'll be asking your questions to Dr. Tate. Um, Shirley, thank you so much for that. You have um, done a wonderful job sort of uh, explaining and um, touching on how racism is felt by Black people in academia and, and elsewhere. And it really got me thinking um, your, the notion of being touched in the head. That's something that sort of resonates with me because a lot of times when you experience racism and you go to your colleagues to explain um, the incident and how it made you feel, you're sort of presented as someone who's a little bit drained, right? There's a lot of uh, excuses that are being told as if uh, what you're experiencing is not really what took place that you're being too sensitive. And yeah. so the messaging is that you're touching the head and you, and not only that's the messaging and how you're presented, but you internalize that and you yourself question, um, you, you yourself question the experience and you, and you replay it over and over to sort of see, mm -hmm. am I being sensitive? This, did this really take place? Yeah. Um, which leads me to my first question, um, which we gather from our colleagues at the Black Graduate Students Association. Thank you so much for doing this on our behalf. Um, so the question is, how can Black faculty, staff, and students name and respond to the touch of anti-Black racism when, other, when others do not see it or refuse to see it? Oh, that's a, a very good question. Thank you for your wonderful comments also about my talk. Um, this is, of course, something that I myself um, struggled with, too, for many decades as an academic. Um, what you say is, is so right. It takes you a while to sit and to think and to wonder and then to go back to it. The, this paper, um, the long paper that's been published that I've given you a short version of now, I would say that for some of the people I interviewed, maybe it took them 15 years to think about what had really happened. For myself, it took me about 10 to think about it. So, um, yeah. So, but how can black faculty and students name and respond, right, to anti-black racism when others refuse to feel it or do not? Okay, so I think uh, what I want to look at in, in this uh, question is the refusal to feel with us, with the racialized other. And this comes from a politics in which uh, we are not seen as human. Sylvia Winter talks about this when she discusses the emergence of the human as white during colonialism. And she begins with the Portuguese landing in 1441 on the coast of present day Senegal. So this uh, making us unhuman, um, to human, to humanization has got like a really long history. Sylvia Winter also speaks about the continuation of this within the police response of no human involved, NHI, uh, when she talks about the beating of Rodney King in the United States all those years ago in her open letter to the Black Studies faculty in the United States. This is some of what I think underlies the white refusal to feel we are not seen as human. What can also underlie this refusal, of course, is what Robin D'Angelo talks about. Uh, she talks about white fragility. For Robin D'Angelo, you know, this, uh, this occurs when the world uh, which is built and is known in a particular way by those racialized as whites is questioned. And their certainties, um, because of these questions, then produce a lot of dissonance people feel a lot of dissonance. So D'Angelo outlines a range of behaviors which can then ensue. One of them is refusal, uh, which you can get from silencing, not saying anything, leaving the distressing situation. But you can also get refusal through anger, for example, or argumentation. 
admission of blame, shame, and guilt if they feel the touch of anti-Black racism through our complaints can also lead, lead to refusal if we take the Angelo's white fragility into account. So it's a very willful kind of refusal. If we think of refusal to feel in terms of uh, Charles Mills's racial contract, for example, to which people racialized as white and their descendants uh, draw benefit and are attached, we see that there are benefits to be gained from the refusal to feel with us. White privilege comes from the racial contract and refusal to feel maintains that. Refusal also maintains whiteness as a global system of privilege with different implications and inflections depending on when and where it has been produced according to Von Ware. Naming and responding to anti-blackness happens for me through accessing the socio-diagnostics. That's what um, Luis Ricardo uh, Gordon talks about, the ability to, um, to look at racism you know, and see its operation and understand where it's coming from and think about what we need to do. So we have to access the socio-diagnostics of critical race theory, decolonial theory, black feminist theory and black queer theory. When we feel racism, we then have to do something else. We have to take the risk of naming it. We have to do this because not saying something, not acting is not an option for us as black people. Why isn't it an option? If we don't act, we ourselves keep racism in place. We keep anti-Black racism in place if we don't act. Our naming and responding to the feeling is already, I think, decolonial anti-racist work. It is what uh, Walter Mignola calls epistemic disobedience. I would call it uprising and somebody like Amis Zayer might also call, call it um, disidentification with uh, coloniality. Audre Lorde, the late Audre Lorde made, made us aware of the importance of verbalizing the pain of racism. We can't keep it within ourselves. We have to verbalize it. We have to talk about how it makes us feel as we sense it. And we need to talk about it and how it makes us feel as we sense it, because in doing that, we're also talking about injustice. And this sensing and speaking for Audre Lorde is the erotic politics that binds groupings together. The erotic, she says, is power vested in our unrecognized feelings, which is a resource for political action. So speaking leads to action. For Audre Lorde, we must recognize what we feel. We must notice our suffering. We must notice our negation. We must notice our numbness to enable, enable political action. And An Anling Cheng also tells us that we must go from grief, the pain that we feel from daily racist assault. We must go from grief to complaint, to talk about it, to political action. So for us, anti-racist critique is not an option. We cannot refuse to, to do it out of fear. Instead, we should refuse the aloneness in which we are cast institutionally because very often we are the only ones wherever we are and we have to find safe havens of anti-racist coalition from which to engage in anti-racist socio-diagnostics. And the reason we have to find safe haven is because we must heal. And part of that is, I think, just to end, we must remember that we're really not alone, even though sometimes we feel very, very, very alone. Yes, thank you for that, um, Dr. Tade. Um, I really like how you sort of mentioned that we need to name it and not experience um, um, the experiences in, in silence, right? But going to your um, example of that office sharing or room sharing incident, um, when the Black colleague um, sort of voiced her discomfort in that situation of sharing a room with somebody she, she did not know and, and didn't get a good um, response from, when she made that complaint, she was basically kind of told that, you know, she's being ir irrational and that this person is not racist when racism wasn't even brought up. That wasn't what yeah. she 
he has st stated, and it really talks to uh, uh, talks a little. Uh, it talks to how uh, institutional university policies sort of uh, sustain um, um, anti-black uh, racism and racism mm -hmm. in general. Some of these discrimination. Mm -hmm. Why is it so hard for uh, universities to um, commit to meaningful anti-racist transformation? And what possibilities might the post George Floyd um, uh, su uh, uh, situation that we find ourselves in um, may bring to that? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you, uh, Zara, and thank, thank you to members of BGSA for raising that one. Okay, so um, I think I want to start with uh, Franz Sanon. <laughs> You know me, I'm, he's one of my go-to uh, theorists. He wrote an essay in 1956 called Racism and Culture, which was published in a special in issue of Presence African. And um, what he says in, in that essay is that racism isn't something that's like a super added element discovered by chance in any society. He says, um, that racism is part of many societies and social groups, many countries, many civilizations, especially those that are colonialists. So he says, the racist in a country with racism is therefore a normal thing and every colonialist group is racist. So we have to keep that in mind, um, I think, always and, and not deny it. So universities are a microcosm of society. So if societies are racist, then we can't expect universities not to be. Commitment to meaningful anti-racist transformation will not occur without this acknowledgement of institutional racism. And even with that acknowledgement, um, meaningful anti-racist transformation remains elusive. There are still problems. One of those problems, I, I think, um, is spoken about quite convincingly by Tiffany King um, when she says that part of the problem is that within the academy and in some activist circles, black and indigenous dialogue continues to be mediated by white modes of speech and liberal humanist protocols for understanding, theorizing and addressing genocide and the afterlife of slavery. So we ourselves we ourselves as racialized others are caught within um, white modes of speech and liberal humanist protocols for addressing genocide and the afterlife of slavery. We see this in equality, diversity, inclusion and decolonization um, talk and policies, for example. We also saw this in people taking the knee and in university statements of support after the summer of BLM. Um, which ensued from George, George Floyd's death. White modes of speech and liberal humanist protocols mean that the need for anti-Indigenous, Black and people of color racism measures and decolonization really tend to be ruled out as subversive and ideological. And this is what we've seen as the aftermath of uh, BLM 2020. We see this now, for example, in the state culture wars against critical race studies, intersectionality and post-colonial studies in the US, UK, France and Germany. So we have a massive state backlash against hashtag BLM because this was seen as black insurgency and revolt against a very denied white supremacy. In the UK, critical race theory and intersectionality were first spoken about in Parliament in October 2020, last year, as problems for state education systems by Kemi Badenoch, the Conservative Equalities Minister, who is also Black. The UK government commissioned a report into racism led by Tony Sewell, himself Black, which returned the verdict that the UK was not institutionally racist and that as a white majority country, the, <laughs> I have to laugh, sorry. <laughs> and that as a white majority country, the UK led the world in race relations and equity. Boris Johnson has said that the nation's colonial past should remain intact. 
The government is also in the UK is also trying to pass a new policing bill which criminalizes demonstrations and is considering not funding arts, humanities and social science courses. Shifting to the US, Kimberly Crenshaw and the African American Policy Forum sent out emails on the 13th of May. I don't know if any of you got them this year with the subject line, we need your help. CRT under attack. I just want to quote from it really briefly. It starts, dear friends, across the United States, dangerous attacks on racial justice are spreading like, like wildfire. These attacks seek to prohibit the teaching and use of vital frameworks like critical race theory and intersectionality and aim to smother honest engagement with our nation's history. On Tuesday, over objections from business and education groups, the Texas House voted to pass a bill that supporters describe as an effort to keep critical race theory from being taught in schools. Within the last week, the governor of Oklahoma signed into law House Bill 1775, which restricts the teaching of racism and sexism across Oklahoma state universities and public school systems. These examples show that post George Floyd, the state is hard at work to reinstate the white supremacy status quo. And <clears throat> the moment might have already been consigned history after universities uh, in Canada issued their statements and in initiated cluster hires into a system of white modes of speech and liberal humanist protocols, much as happened in the United States as well. There were no cluster hires in the UK because <laughs> as you saw from what I said earlier, there are no problems there. So in terms of possibilities, it's sort of one step forward and two steps back, I think, in a system built on black death in which we have to take responsibility for anti-racism in order to survive and have liberal lives. We have to take responsibility, even though it is white supremacy and white racial privilege that underlies institutional and systemic anti-blackness. Not a nice answer, so that I know. No, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. It was brilliant. Um, so we're going to take questions from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. Again, um, there are a number of questions from the audience, and we have a lot of time uh, to be in conversation with Dr. Um, or the, with Dr. Tate. So please keep the questions coming. So this first question, it's a little, it's a comment and a question. Um, so I'll get right into it. When it comes to racism in academia, we have a hard time, first of all, providing that racism exists. Uh, sorry, proving that racism exists and occurred because instit institutions pretend to be immune to racism. And secondly, those affected by race, racism tend to be treated as the problem and not yeah. the victims. Um, as the problem and not um, the victims. There mm -hmm. we go. Um, Sorry about that. And, and as a problem and not the victim. Lastly, racism is treated um, as conflict resolution and not a systemic issue, maybe even a misunderstanding. The yes. finger always pointed at the racialized other. Mm -hmm. We're always justifying ourselves because this discursive space called the university is not built to include us. And the question mm -hmm. is, how can one navigate such a hostile environment? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for that. All your observations are absolutely shared. I share them completely. And I think, <laughs> I think many, many black colleagues which will share your um, observations and your feelings. Um, how do we, how do we navigate such hostility on a daily basis, right? Um, it's, it's a personal question, but it's also one that relates to what can we do as a group? in terms of anti-racist black politics, black anti-racist politics, I should say, because we need both. One of the things that I've, I've had to do in order to survive the really toxic environment I found myself in, in the UK for like over 30 years, was to realize one thing, that is that the institution did not belong to me, it was not mine, much as I didn't feel comfortable within it, 
people within the institution who make the institution up did not feel comfortable with me being their colleague. And they showed this to me in, in, in a number of ways. So how could I survive that? How I survived that was finding people outside of the institutions that I worked in with whom I could make common cause, whether that was to do anti-racist politics broadly, set up, for example, um, a black community AIDS team, you know, at, at the point in which HIV and AIDS was not being seen within black communities in the UK, um, set up a black feminist um, um, counseling group, peer counseling group. Uh, so we have to find common cause with others outside of our institutions, because within our institutions, we aren't even extended just the common courtesy of collegiality. So we need to see ourselves in that space of marginalization. I think, I think the moment for me when I realized I was very marginal to the institution was a very empowering one for me because then I never expected, <laughs> I never expected to get anything. I never expected to get promoted. I never expected to be mentored. I never expected to be sponsored. I never expected anything. I never expected to become a professor actually. Um, so I think that was a, a, a great liberation for me, really. It enabled me then um, to, um, to write what I liked, which some of which was this work that I started to do then after many decades of thinking about it and talking to other, other Black women, especially about it too, right? So um, I think what we have to do is to find ways in which we can survive as individuals. It could be that you need to get counseling. That helped me too, quite a lot. Um, it could be that you have to uh, not just think about um, your mind, but also think about your body because they're linked. So going to the gym is also good. Right? Um, and speak, talk about it. Talk about what's happening with people who understand you and won't second guess you and won't say, no, that didn't happen. I can't believe it, you know, uh, because that's what happens when we talk um, with our colleagues racialized as white very often within the institutions. They don't believe it and they think there's something wrong with you and that you're causing, mm, you know, a big, a big kind of ruckus over nothing. You know, and why are you rocking the boat like that, Shirley? Just be nice. Stop being an angry black woman. That's also another one. Um, so a bit of a rambling answer, but I think you get what I mean. You really have to think of ways of protecting yourself so that you can survive within these institutions, actually, because, you know, they don't, I, I haven't found necessarily that they they feed me. They do because they pay my salary. But what I mean is feed me emotionally, feed me psychically, feed me politically. I, I have not found that in universities. I found that outside. I think that's really a um, good point um, in terms of creating that and um, a safe space and network for yourself and pretend, protecting your mental health. Um, from the audience, we have two questions on the relationship between racism and touch. Um, to be touched can mean um, can mean a little crazy and can also mean moved in a positive way. Is this ambiguity at, at work in a way that anti anti black racism, invisible uh, racism operates? Sorry, I think I butchered that. Let me just re ask. That question. <laughs> it keeps it keeps moving. Sorry about that. Um, it's all right. So um, the question is. Um, that to be touched can mean a little crazy and can also mean moved in a positive way. Is this ambiguity at work in, in the ways that anti-Black invisible racism operates? Mm -hmm. and um, well, if, if you're going to be touched in a positive way, then that would mean then that you would begin to see the point of view or to inhabit the space of the racialized other of my space, for example, your space, that or two, right? Um, so I, I would, I would see that um, as being like a positive movement forward, being being touched by um, the suffering of the other. That is like a a really positive, like anti-racist movement, right? Um, 
an, a kind of an effective movement towards the other. You could see it as that, as you identify with what they're going through, rather than constantly questioning them and doubting the veracity of what they're saying, right? Which is the touched in the head part. Then they might be a little crazy. You know, they didn't see it right. You know, Mike's a nice guy. I don't know why she constantly has to say things about him like that. He's like that with everyone. It's just all in her head, really. It's not true. You know, you can get those kinds of um, things being said about you in the staff room, for example, or amongst colleagues when they go for coffee from which you are constantly excluded to, you know, because there's no sociality, no kind of hand of friendship reaching out to, towards you with an identificatory touch, right? Yeah. And there's another question um, in line with that. It says, hi, Dr. Tate. As I was listening to your talk, I find myself reflecting on how there is both disgust in being close to Black people, and yet there's also entitlement to touch Black people. Example, touching Black people's hair. Yeah. As I think of moving, um, as I think of a more specific word aside from anti-Black racism to describe this, what do you think takes place when it comes to the relationship between racism and touch? Hmm. Yeah, I think one thing that touch does, I'm, I'm specific, I'm, I'm actually quite taken by your example of um, touch of, touching black hair. Because, you know, like, like as black women, we don't like people touching our hair in general terms, right? Um, so, uh, but black children get their hair touched a lot in school as well. And what that touch is, is, is a touch of distancing. It's, it's a touch that does not um, that does not hold proximity within it. You know, I don't know how, I don't know how to explain it to you, but, but there's, it's pro ah, I know, probably a touch of condescension, right? Of showing that you are different from the, 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 the self-racialized as white. And, the, and in that difference is also subordination as well, right? So touching a hair, a head of hair, which you've not been invited to touch is already a kind of like a claim. I would see it as a claim on you as their property that they can do with as they like. So then when you say, no, don't touch my hair. I don't like people touching my hair. Then that's you being aggressive because all they wanted to do was just to see what it felt like. How many of you have had that experience? A lot, a lot of us black women have had that experience. Right? I just wanted to see what it felt like. I, I was told once in the UK, I wanted to see if it felt like a, a Brillo pad. Do you have Brillo pads in Canada? I don't know if you do, you know, you use it to scrub pans. I just want to see if it felt like a Brillo pad. Oh, but it's really soft. How surprising. This hair, right? Anyway, so it's about distancing, even though it's about proximity at the same time. And that proximity is about, um, subjugation of the black other seen as different. Thank you. Um, naming and talking uh, and not keeping quiet. What do we do if the environment we find ourselves does not accommodate the naming or there's really nowhere to do the naming? Yeah, that is a massive problem. I completely, absolutely get that because like for many years, I, it's not that I refused to name, but I named it outside. I never named it inside the institution because that for me was not a safe space to do that. Um, so when you start, you know, like you're an assistant professor in, in the UK, we're like lecturers, senior lecturers, right? So as a lecturer, you are like the bottom of the food chain. If you say, and, and you know, you, you've got to do, um, what, what do we call it again? I can't remember, but it's kind of like tenure, right? So you've got to get tenure, right? Uh, so in the UK, we call it probation. That's it. You have a probationary period of three years. In those three years, you know, you can't, you can't really say things like, I've experienced such incredible, egregious racism in this institution. Why? Because they'll find a reason then not to, um, you know, make you pass your probation, they'll find some kind of reason, oh, you know, your work isn't up to scratch. Um, you're not, you've not been a very good colleague, you've not done enough service. So they keep your probation going, right? We, we have permanent jobs, so they can't really uh, sack you, they can't fire you, but they can keep, keep you in 
keep you in the place they think you should be until you retire. For me, that was going to be as associate professor for the whole of my life as an academic in that institution, right? Because I decided to speak out. Um, so, so I was not anybody's like favorite colleague. You know, I was never anyone's friend, but not everybody, anybody's favorite colleague because I decided to speak out. So I could never be promoted to full professor in that institution at all. But in, in the same era where, when I was told, you know, um, do you know what you've applied for? You've applied to be promoted to professor. You, your, your CV just doesn't cut it. In that same year, I was given a professorship in South Africa and one in another UK institution. So what I'm telling you is there's always a risk and a danger that you have to be aware of in speaking out. And sometimes you can't do it at that point in time in a very in a very kind of upfront and open way, right? So maybe you do it outside, maybe you write about it, right? You can write in the conversation, for example, or write an article, get it published, right? And get some really good points on your CV. So think of other ways, I would say, think of ways that don't endanger you, but if you're not bothered about being endangered, and um, you know you're prepared to take legal action things like that if necessary then just say it and anyway i think you should try and practice saying it outside before you say it inside because sometimes that very delaying of it and practicing of it outside makes it easier for you to say inside right Thank you for that, Shirley. Um, I think this is something we all struggle with, like how do we find spaces to name our experiences when those spaces are not within our um, within the institution? So I'll just move along to the next question in the interest of time. Um, in Canada, do you see similar um, indicators of uh, backlash against anti-racism education that Dr. Crenshaw and others are seeing in the USA? What can we do to proactively counter this trend in Canada? Um, well, I, I haven't seen anything yet in Canada, but I don't know the Canadian scene as well as I know the UK one, for example. So you would have to tell me if you've seen um, that trend. But it wouldn't surprise me if that trend was already there anyway, because it, it just seems to be, um, you know, a kind of euro north american sort of a, a movement really right because you, you know it started with trump's united states and it went to the uk then it's now got to other parts of europe and it's kind of just doing the circle around so i'm sure it's actually it's actually there in canada but i mean i suppose this um this links to um uh, one of the questions um as well um around uh, post-secondary education as a non-Eurocentric space, right? I suppose it links to, to that kind of a, a question. Um, I think someone like um, Walter Mignolo um, is, might be kind of good to think through this issue with really, because he talks about something that we should engage in called epistemic disobedience. He sees this as a direct political, social and cultural response to coloniality, which is actually what we are living in this kind of attack on critical race theory and attack on intersectionality, you know, in the culture wars that exist at the moment. Um, this response of epistemic disobedience means that we have to question Eurocent Eurocentricity, and we have to think about its links to colonialism and continuing coloniality, capitalism, liberalism, and individualism, according to Walter Mignolo. And some, something else that we have to think about is racism itself. We have to see racism as not necessarily being rooted in ignorance and hate, not necessarily, but being about really powerful group interests, the very powerful group interests um, of white supremacy, which we still see in the continuation of the Eurocentric curriculum in white settler colonial states and former colonies. So, for example, um, we know that uh, 
we've had black studies in the United States for some time, but now we have a backlash against that. And we've having kind of a, an erosion of it for many decades, according to uh, people that I know there, we also have black diaspora studies. So we know we have like examples of um, anti-Eurocentrism already operating in, in universities. We also have other examples globally, for example, um, the one of Africanization in South African universities and affirmative action policies in, in Brazilian universities. So, you know, we, we can draw from the global south as well in terms of what, what we need to do in the global north. In, in South Africa, for example, the calls for Africanization of the curriculum and the faculty um, are a direct outcome of political action. They're also a direct outcome of the decolonization, which the country is still undergoing. And the political action I'm talking about, for example, um, hashtag roads must fall, student led, has, hashtag fees must fall, student led, and the open Stellenbosch um, movement as well. Again, student led. Affirmative action policies in Brazilian universities are aimed at enabling students who are black, indigenous, quilombola, um, to enter universities and to progress. And these groups, Black, Indigenous and Quilombola people in uh, Brazil are the most underrepresented student groups. So we can see examples from the global south of what can be done. What these state university student faculty actions are doing is responding to epistemic injustice. And Jose Medina talks about epistemic injustice of coloniality, for example, unequal access and participation, which we already have in Canada, we know this, we already have that in the US, we already have it across Europe, right? So unequal access and participation. Also about the norms of what counts as knowledge and the man marginalization of the non-normative with within disciplinary canons. And what um, Medina suggests we should do is we should engage in epistemic resistance. It's <laughs> everything to do with anti-racism is about resistance. You know, <laughs> it's not it's not about resistance is futile. It's more about resistance is a must. We have to do it. Um, and this epistemic resistance we can see, for example, in the South African and the Brazilian examples, and indeed in Black Studies um, programs and Black diaspora studies as well. By epistemic resistance, what Jose Medina means is we have to use our epistemic resources and abilities to undermine norms. And we also have to undermine the effective functions that sustain oppressive structures. So it's, more, it's just about work. <laughs> Everything is just about work. Thank you. Um, so we are almost at time. So I'll ask one final question. Um, and this one is around how do different generations nav navigate Black Lives Matter, sexism, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, all, and, and this notion that all hope lies with the, the younger generation. Is it fair to expect young, uh, the young to change the world as we often do? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's a really great question we always look towards the young to see, to see change. But I think that we have to do something else. We have to recognize that we, we have to make the change that we want to see. Right? We, all generations, none of us are excused uh, in terms of anti-racist action. We all have to participate. We can't say, <laughs> we can't say I've, I've done my bit. I've done my bit. I've, I've had it now. I'm in my sixties, let the young people do it. No. There's always a role that we all can do something in terms of anti-racist um, action, uh, whether that's in the academy or without, right? We can't, we can't say we can't go on a march because I don't want to get arrested. We'll let the young people do that. No, if, if we feel we want to go, then that's what we should do. Age does not matter at all. And we shouldn't expect young people to be at the forefront of taking anti-racist action into the future. We also have a role to play as, as elders <laughs> within the movement. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Tate. That's all the questions we have time for. Thank you all for participating and engaging um, in this conversation. On behalf of everyone here, thank you so much, Dr. Tate, for your brilliant work and this engrossing and timely conversation. Thank you to the Big Thinking Series sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities, uh, Humanities Research Council, University of Canada, and the Canada Foundation for Innovation for their generous support. If you would like to revisit Dr. Tate's talk and this conversation, the video will be available on the Congress 2021 platform in the coming days. The next Big Thinking event will take place this Monday, May 31st at 12.15 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Professor Abraham X. Kendi, Andrew W. Mellon, Professor in Humanities at Boston University and the founding director of the BU Center for Anti-Racism Research will speak on how to be anti-racist. Do join us and mark your calendars. One final note, the BGSA held an undergraduate student essay competition and the winning essays and student bios can be found on the Ubuntu Lounge FIA Congress 2021 platform. In there, you can also find videos of our, of our most recent confer conference on the Black student experience in academia. Thank you once again for joining us this afternoon and hope you have a great Congress. Be safe and take care. Thank you.